So, all right. Morning, Nadja. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing all right. Yeah, thank you for joining me this morning. Nadja Guarica Batiste, manager of the Trinidad and Tobago Girls Under 19s team and also of the Women's Cricket Club at UE. And we're going to speak some cricket. The Women's CPL gets on the way. 2023 gets on the way on August 31st. That's about eight days from now. Uh, but there are some issues, some issues, because although the games for, for the actual women's CPL increased this year from, from last year, we're moving basically from an 11-game season to a seven-game season. So, Nadja, in your view, what light does a seven-game game competition, excuse me, uh, paint the organizers in? Well, to be honest, I was quite looking forward to the 60 component of it. I'm not sure if there was an official announcement uh, made about it, but I know I'll definitely miss it. In our region where we have few international tournaments for women, I think there would be increased interest in a tournament with more matches. Now, granted, we've attracted some names such as Susie Bates and Sophie Devine. 11 games is a better attraction than seven to come to the Caribbean. And with a short season, many of them might be play, might be weighing the value of traveling, especially, you know, with the team rotation aspect. You yeah. always have to factor in your entire squad. It's best to, to factor in your entire squad when you're playing in a tournament. So I'm I'm thinking that players must play in foreign conditions to get exposure to enhance their performance. Mm -hmm. In this case, we probably can't do as much to us as we would like to. So we bring them to us. Because I believe that a player learns so much in the dressing room. And the more time you spend with a higher caliber of players, the more technical and strategic knowledge and best practice you can gain from it. And that's what you want. You always want to come out with something new, something extra you haven't done before to give you an advantage. Now, as a cricketer, you're always a student. Last year, we had nine overseas players in the inaugural edition of the CPL. We had the experience of Atapatu, Sri Lanka's highest run get 2020s. We had Kaka, the Women's Player of the Year for South Africa. Chloe Tryon, over 170 caps for South Africa. Yes, we have attracted more, but it's interesting that it wasn't continued this year. But increasing opportunities for West Indian women to get involved in cricket should be a priority. And even if I want to just touch over to the men for a sec, it seems like a, a, a few of our Caribbean players have benefited from the experience of playing international franchise tournaments. For example, I, I always like to say, for me personally, Russell is one that I saw that got better with his involvement in franchise crickets as opposed to where he started. Because for me, you mix with the, with the players, the international um, experience, it really impacts you. Even our own in Trinidad, Dwayne Bravo, he's spoken so much about his experience at his franchise teams and how those captains would have impacted his captaincy. I think those sort of experiences for our women could do the same thing for our ladies. Even with the 60 last year, and I, I draw lots on the 60 because I believe that that shorter format of the game has really helped develop the sport. The overall economic impact was really great for the region as well. So when we look at um, increased tournaments, it's a lot of linkages to different industries, sports, marketing, networking, um, tourism. It's it's something that you really want by increasing the number of games. So you're, hand, you're doing two things. You're enhancing the, the capacity and you're also bringing um, foreign revenue to the Caribbean region, which is something we, we, we look forward to in terms of our operations here. You spoke about fan engagement, and I, I remember Dutton, um, Matthews, and Taylor when they sat at the end of tournament press conference, and they were so excited. And Shakira Selman as well, she was speaking on a space that um, Cricket West Indies held and how interactive the fans uh, um, and engaging the fans became as time went on, as the women's competition went on last year and our touch the 
got to the ladies and how they were getting familiar with them and how they came out to see them. So it's a bit disappointing that we didn't use the 12 months that we had prior to increase the number of games, honestly. So now having spoken about the obvious and general need for an increase in the number of games, the next step would be to increase the number of franchises. But Nadja, based on the players you come in contact with in your position and any wider information you might have access to, can you assess then the current uh, talent pool of cricketers in, in the Caribbean to see how like an extended version of the women's CPA, what quality cricket would it produce in your eyes? Are we ready well, so, uh, well, as we know, it's crucial to identify and nurture young talents. We know that's essential for the growth and success of sports. Um, I can say locally at the Trinidad and Tobago Women's Cricket Association competitions, for both the T20 and 50 over 30 over aspects, there are roving personnel searching for that talent. Even at the recently concluded Rising Stars on a 19 women's tournament, yes, there was there were personnel um, present to identify that talent. Um, chatting with some of my colleagues, both locally and regionally, I think club structures have a lot to do with the talent pool um, and the availability of developed players. So developing an availability of developed players. Sometimes in my discussions, it seems like maybe some teams are just built for winning as opposed to development. I'll give you an example. Maybe you have a tournament with five teams, six teams, and you have two or three teams stacked with national or very experienced players, while other teams are struggling to pull a, a team of 11 players together who may or may not have a lot of experience. So where's the challenge? If all the good, good or experienced players are in a few teams, then where's the challenge there? You are playing together. You're making great scores against um less experienced opposition. Now, when we get out to regional levels and international levels, where's the challenge, right? So I've always felt, I've had this discussion so many times with different people and sometimes I'm in the minority, but I always feel that because the pool of women, women generally, whether you can play or not, or whatever stages, maybe there should be a franchise-like approach where different levels of experience players are scattered across the various teams to make it more competitive being against each other than with each other. Because really, at the end of the day, we don't have a lot of pathways as a men. So I think that the onus is on the club administrators to create that highly skilled and competitive environment. I mean, if you have better domestic crickets, it's greater outputs at the national and international level. So get into the second part of your question. The talent pool is quite promising. So this year, I experienced my first stint as a manager of the Grand Tobago Under-19 women's team. And from what I understand, I was screening back in February, 29 ladies showed up for that screening, which is like a record for us at, at, that, at that age. Right. And there were still, I think, two or three people that, out, that were out of the country that did not um, show up on the copy. Okay. So we have a lot of players to choose from, and we have a lot of passionate players. Can we put them into five or six franchise teams, Chris Anya, right now? Well, the simple answer is no. In the last couple of years, though, Cricket West Indies has been having several developmental initiatives through the Emerging Players Academy, involving a lot of under-19 players across the region. Mm -hmm. You would regularly find names involved like Zayla James, Nijani Kamabach, yeah. Janaba Joseph, Chanel Sao, mm -hmm. Samara Ramnach, Lini Samaru, Trishan yeah. Holder. You know, there are a lot of them. So it means that there is hope, there is promise. Because yes. growing up, you heard a few names. You heard... True. Kayla, Anissa, long ago you would have heard Marissa Aguilera. She's retired now. Anissa Mawad is, is in the twilight. You know, you always heard three or four names. Recently you would have been hearing Haley, but now you're hearing different names. And it augurs well for the future, but in the medium term, I think it's maybe um, a better yardstick to say, yes, we can do that. A lot of cricket comes down to investments and what is the return on my investment as well. The passion is there, but in the corporate sector, you always want to know what is my return when I invest in you. 
and investment is really needed to ensure that there are pathways for players, facilities for players, and coaching for players. And interesting thing about the facilities is that there are so many male competitions. T10, yeah. T20, Division, this Premier One. And it's like the facilities and the um the grounds, they are always in use. So then where do the women get to train? So simple areas where people can invest, even in sponsoring uh, uh, a specific time, space for, for ladies to train. You know, that's what we're looking for. And I think that the key is to get more women in key decision-making positions. So I know some time back, there was a lot of talk about by a certain year, they wanted to see, ICC wanted to see a lot more women in administrative positions and coaching, et cetera. And I think coaching is very important as well in bringing out that um, full potential of talent and that talent pool we talk about because a lot of people, I mean, I don't want to sound any strange way here, but a lot of people, their name is coach, but can they coach or can they coach what is in front of them? So sometimes you know things and this is not relating to coaching alone but to really pass that on to somebody to learn from it you know that i think requires a special type of skill and i've always believed too that women know women and that's why we need to have them in the key positions because we know what challenges we face as women and i think that that is really important going forward to really realize the true potential of talent pool that we have existing right now. But what Trinidad and Tobago does so well and better than the rest of the Caribbean is that they play a lot of cricket. A lot of the girls are always in action. You're roaming the sites and you're looking through the TNT sports pages. There, there, There's always some cricket for the girls to be playing. You don't see yes. that much in Jamaica and some of the other countries. So we could take a, a page regardless of everything else. Despite everything else, we could take a page from um, the book of TNT in terms of girls playing cricket because you do play more than the others. So. And I can... Yeah, go ahead. I can tell you that the vice president, she really pushes the cricket. Uh, the Rising Star Series, she would have organized, so she along with her team would have organized the Tri Nation series back in Easter, where we hosted the Bunwood Islands and Barbados, just for the girls, all, all teams involved, to get a feel of what the competition is like. And it's something that is really ongoing. Also, we would have known that, well, we haven't done it for the past couple of years, but there's the, the T20 Grand Slam franchise tournament. So, yes, they are always looking for ways to push your talent. Because long ago, you, you just really can't play cricket from January to May. And then there's a lull, increase the involvement in cricket. I know recently there have been, within the last two or three months, a lot of female cricket camps and programs that are encouraging as young as five years to come out and learn the sport. Now, not ever that. And that's you to go down to the lower level, school level, and, and get that interest and get that excitement coming from there. Tanya? Your audio dropped a bit. You hear me now? Yes. Right. So I was saying we're on the topic of T20 cricket. And we, we, we had that in so aggressive. Uh, Taylor Moore for touch player. And Matthews can be well, very aggressive as well, but maybe a hybrid, a hybrid of, of, of both. We do we have Zeta James coming through coming through. We have Trishan Holder. Uh very aggressive as well. But in general, there are not many batters around the Caribbean that we can say that we have this one's aggressive, that one's aggressive. What do you think goes into to making a creative batter and why don't we have many in the Caribbean? 
Well, you mentioned some power hitting names and over the last few years, the strike rates and averages have increased in the C20. So now international strike rates uh, at maybe 130 plus mm. and the average score in the 20 I believe that's, you know, you mentioned Zeta James and I will never forget. Mm. When she was selected to play in the South African, in the World Cup in South Africa, she came in the long, I think was too long, off, off one of the more notable English bowlers and it really speaks about the, the fearlessness of youth, right? But that was an aside. All batters <laughs> should be able to bat aggressively because of the type of situations that a T20 can call for at any stage. Sometimes you want 20 in a last over and you're batting with maybe seven, eight, nine wickets. You want all players to be able to come out and hit that ball. Now, Technique has a, a large part of it because there are things you must be sure of, your head position, back lift, use of feet, the extension of the arms, balancing your weight. So it's not, to me, it's not too much of one more than the other. Mentally, it stems from a type of conditioning and, and doing right things for a long period of time. And doing that we're going to, is going to help with the mental aspect. Mental cricket involves thinking, strategizing, and managing your emotions optimally to express yourself in an innings because we listen to cricket and a lot of wicket keepers are very true. Even in my short experience, you're batting and the keeper behind you is in your head. She can't hit this. She can't do that. She does not know how to bat. And, you know, it, it really gets to you. And that's why I think too, sports psychologists play a key role as well in being present with the setup of a team or being accessible to a team. There's also the issue of physical conditioning. The mind and the body are physical expressions of the brain. Failure, yeah. anxiety, panic, they stem from the inability to relax and, you know, logically survey a situation. So there must be a balance with the technique, with the mental side of it, with the physical you need to set goals for each of these aspects as we go along. And I think that the territorial boards should provide, for example, we spoke about the sport psych psychologists, facilities such as these for these players. And in this era that we're living in with a lot of social media influencing persons, it's easy to have one or two innings and then say, okay, maybe I shouldn't have played that track. Maybe I shouldn't have been that aggressive and you go and you go into the wicket and it's in your head and you can't get out get it out of your head and you're thinking what's going to happen if I come down take a swipe or you know but being aggressive is integral in today's cricketing environment especially as we are largely involved in shorter format but it's not just one aspect it's 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 a bit of it's a bit of three and this is where I said the administrators really need to get in and create that environment and have those sources available. I know in our club, that's back at UWE, um, one of the things we, we have been talking about in terms of power hitting, because we found that even at the local competitions, the teams are a little bit top heavy. So you get one, two, three scoring, and then coming down, it's, it's a bit of a struggle. I myself, I'm a low order batter, so you know how it is. But what we have been trying to do is set up some nets. Do net, net practice and just have sessions only with power hitting. Doesn't matter if you get out in, 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 in the beginning because you're learning what to do and what not to do. So that is something we want to do. One thing, one thing I learned, I spoke earlier about um, learning in the dressing room. One of the things that really stuck out to me this year in my stint is we always hear practice makes perfect. But what I was told is practice makes permanent. So we continue practicing the right thing and it's going to stick. So I think that's a, a lot of practices. Doing the right thing is, is really essential to this aggressive style we want to do. But And it can also be, doesn't necessarily have to be muscling the ball or pouring it if you look at someone like Elise Perry. We, we can... You can do a session on gap finding then. Doesn't Because not everyone is going to be... 
has the same physicality as another. So maybe we can, why, why don't we have more gap finders then? Why do we have so many players hitting fielders, not being able to put away the bad delivery? Then is it, does it go along the same line as why don't we have many aggressive batters? Is it the same well, ideology? Do you think? I think you're you're correct because as as you alluded to, not everybody is built in the same way, and not everybody can carry the ball over the net. So, yes, it takes a lot of practice, but this is why I think in assessing the needs and abilities of your team, there are diminutive people that can hit, and there are diminutive people that as you say, can hit you the gaps. So yes, I think it's very important as well because a lot of, in my short experience, a lot of coaches, they focus on the game, yes, but even things like feeling positions and knowing where to place the ball, sometimes not so much attention is paid to that. But I was looking at a CPL game last night and I was watching one of the batters scoring runs and placing that ball. And even if I take my, my mind back to even Lara, didn't get much of the T20 set up. But when you think back at his game, a lot of his runs were scored through excellent placements through the gaps. Lovely cover drive, you can stop that. So yes, I, I think that's a good um thing you added there because yes, power hitting is one, but power hitting, maybe we can interpret that as power hitting through the gaps, drilling it through the gaps as opposed to totally clearing the field. That's one. Do you think the big one now? Do you think Cricket West Indies has done enough to promote women's cricket in general? Because at, at one point, we no longer have that in, but at one point, we had these three stars. Now only Matthews and Taylor remains. No disrespect to anyone else. But at some sometimes, three is two more than other teams had, as in stars, at some point. Some international teams some time ago, you look around, they only have, again, no disrespect to any international player, but just this one close household name. We, us, the Caribbean, West Indies, at one point, we had three. I can't remember what, what came of that. What came of that? What did the no pay increase? No improvement in the domestic structure? We're not well, climbing up the rankings. Are we doing not? Well, it's not me. It's not you, Cricket West Indies. Are they doing enough to promote the women's game? Maybe some may argue that maybe it was left too long, too late to bring youngsters and have them integrate within the team. As I mentioned before, they have been doing the emerging players academy which i think is great and i'll say why i mean personally experiencing it one of the players who plays on the national team for trinidad i saw her back in 2018 and i batted against her and it was the first time i saw her and i i knew she had the potential i didn't know of her i didn't know her anything she wasn't part of the setup and i i told her i say you know as as, as we trainees go to talk your ball and real and you're about to make it. <laughs> and I, I didn't face her the year after. I can't remember why. But then we ha would have had the hiatus with the COVID pandemic. And then I saw her after. And, well, she was selected to attend the camps. And you can see the change. You could see the development. Obviously, still a work in progress. She's young. And she's been part of the camps, part of the setup. And you know, I always chat with her. And I chat with a few of the other on the night is involved and it's always when they come up, yes, we will learn something. It's not that, okay, we're going on a free, free vacation. So, I mean, I can only speak for the recent experience that I've had and based on the, on the girls' interactions as well. Holistically, obviously, you mentioned Dotson and I know there's been a lot surrounding um, her retirement, but she coming up the ranks would have been in a different setting, a different time which I can't speak to, but recently I know, I feel that Cricket West Indies has been making a great effort, even in terms of the accommodation, even in terms of the tournaments. Can more be done? Of course. Just like we're students of the game, of course. We look at things like um, maybe contracts at the domestic level, 
better retain our contracts. Another thing I, I, I looked at, sometimes young players are selected, but they don't feature in a game. Yes, the whole training setup is a learning experience, but the game is good to learn too. So maybe those are things we can look at. Um, there has been an increase in the number of camps. So I think Cricket West Indies is well on its way to developing. Maybe some have described it as we're at an adolescent stage where others are at an adult stage. But at least it's coming. And as I said before, it's it won't be three or four names in times to come. There'll be more than that. And it will be household names. So I think within recent times, there has been that push, there has been that surge. Even, let's, let's step away from Cricket West in a second. Even promoting the cricket. When I would have started some years back playing hardball cricket, and you want to look up research things on players, there were hardly media outlets carrying any stories. Now there are lots of outlets promoting women's cricket. So I think that it's a work in progress. In the medium term, we're going to get those results. And the fact that we had the CPL, some of my team were really rejoicing when they heard it because it was so unbelievable in a sense, especially to know in well, last year, 2022, 2023, we were now having this when Big Bash would have been out since um, 2015 and the New Zealand series would have been for women out in back in 2007, I think. It's a, it's a good step. It's a good step. Decreasing the games as we started this conversation off. Um, maybe it was a step back. But I think that with the thought of players we're attracting, more interest is going to be generated. And I think that we are on our way to really making an impression in any in, in the region with our teams. You said um we're going to have many household names. That one name, give me that one name you're looking forward to uh to see play this year. I mean, I know everybody would expect me to say a Trini, but this one <laughs> yeah, I've seen Miss Janelia Glasgow. She's good. She's really all around. And you know, after talk with Trini's girl, I will get both. <laughs> but I think that our opener, Chanel Sao, she's coming into herself. I mean, I played against her back in 2019, 2018, 2019. She's the opener. And when we saw her, we say, yes, man. She's staying there holding no runs. Mm, not now. She has really benefited and she has really developed from where she was. In the Tri Nation series, her strike rate was really good compared to where she started. And you know you can you you the, the girls will I think it's it's healthy competition. As a matter of fact, I'm saying those two names, but it may be somebody else. Because yeah, I'm from, thinking that I you know who, not necessarily unknown because everybody is excited for Keanu Joseph. But I think I was looking at the West Indies playing the last few series, and usually when she's in the squad. She's in the 11. She's in the final 11. I think the emergence of Zyda James, it gives the, the coaching staff, okay, we have another left arm orthodox option. Maybe we go with an extra batter here or an extra batter mm -hmm. there. The quality of Joseph cannot be questioned, but I think she's in for a big season to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. I am me and, and you can't really fit me into an all-rounder. Pick me as a bonus. Mm -hmm. And my quality, mm -hmm. I think she, but again, we go back to the number of games. What is she going to prove in, in two or three games then? What can she do in two or three games? Yeah. Well, it, there's a lot of promise. There's a lot of promise going forward. It, it's no longer just one or two names. So I think we're in a good position. And at the same time, like I always tell my girls, you have to want it. You have to want it to get it. And it's not a matter of, okay, yeah, we have resources and we just go, we hop on a plane or we go to a camp. You really have to work. And I think once the girls put in the work, with the resources, they're going to get, they're going to exceed the expectations. I think that that is what will happen. Right. Finally, now we read, read the interview um on Crick Info that was published yesterday, Deandra Dutton. And I was thinking about, I was having a conversation with Doc and we were talking about it. Just as franchise cricket has become a threat 
to the men's cricket in, in the Caribbean, we're headed that way because I was thinking of the, the same Trisha Nolda and the ability she has to clear the boundary. The West Indies women, they're not getting paid much. They're not being compensated properly. As time goes on, two, three years from now, and a few franchises look and they see Holder's ability, James's ability, and they go, come play for, it's going to be a struggle, like it is a struggle now for the men's team. And that that's where the question kind of came from. Are Cricket West Indies doing enough? Is Cricket West Indies doing enough? Then for women's cricket, because this is work. This is daily bread. This is making ends meet. Are these players going to say, okay, I'm going to play for West Indies out of loyalty? You know, when they have the opportunity to be properly compensated by or overseas by other leagues. Do you think that this is a problem? Like, I think it is a threat. Do you think it is a threat? Of course. Of course it's a threat. Because where some players are breadwinners for their family, they will look elsewhere. And a lot of female players have spoken about the structure of English tournaments, Aussie tournaments, and the women's CPL is opportunity to showcase their talents. And if, as we mentioned, these scouts see them and pick them up, of course they're going to offer them these um, contracts to play. I mean, Dutton has left West Indies, but Dutton by far is not left um, black and cricket. Right. You know, she's in demand. So this is a big factor, I think, and with the expansion of the, the sport, I mean, it is the fastest growing spectator sport. Um, companies are seeing the worth of advertising um, on these broadcasts. You know, it is going to be generating money. There are career, career progression parts for everybody. So, yes, the retainer contracts, the salaries is something that 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 really has to be on the table. Um, as as I said before, I feel that maybe women in these positions can help to influence some of these decisions. But I also, at the same time, believe that CWI is not going to turn a blind eye on it. So you That's have a Western East team, you want to remain competitive, you don't want to slide down the rankings. Yeah. I mean, even even with that um salary out there, a lot of people do have that loyalty. They do have that desire to represent in national colors. Right. So I, I think it's something that will be worked on. Right. Maybe it should be a little faster than 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 it than right. it might be. But definitely it would pose a challenge with the lucrative offers that the other franchise tournaments um they, they, they put forward to the players. Right. I can't thank you enough, Nadja. How long have we been here? We're taking time out of your morning to sit with me and we're <laughs> running out of time. We only have like a few minutes less. Uh, this was interesting and very informative. It was nice listening to you. Thank you for coming on and having this chat with me. And uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Hey.